Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and today we are looking at the nine GM styles that I've encountered in my role playing experience, but also that I've kind of picked up from other GMs that I've been speaking to. And uh, none of these are right or wrong. And you're probably going to say, well, I'm a bit of that and I'm a bit of that and I've got some of that and I've got a little bit of this and I've got some of that. And sometimes you take on the role of GM as a necessity. Your group just doesn't have someone who wants to be the GM, so it falls to you to kind of bear that burden. So this is an opportunity for you to look at these styles, look at the alternatives, and then to decide if you want to maybe add something or maybe take something away from your GMing style or try a different GMing style. Now, this is definitely going to be a two-part video, uh, simply because there's so much that we can talk about, the different styles. And we're going to look at some of the positives, and we're going to look at some of the negatives of each of these different styles. So let's have a look at just what are the nine GM styles. And to kick us off, we've got the very first one, which is the rules interpreter. Now, the rules interpreter is someone who does the raw. Now, if you haven't come across the term raw before, I certainly hadn't until I think this year, really. Raw stands for rules as written. So as they are written in the rule book, that is how a rules interpreter is going to function. They are going to simply say, well, the rules say X, so that's what you are allowed or not allowed to do. Now, this gives you an incredibly powerful framework with 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 <laughs> with with which in to operate within which that's better within which to operate so it allows any player who knows the rules to be able to step into this kind of game and immediately know that they have complete control over what's going to happen to their character because they understand that the rules are being applied as they were written so that makes for a very good space it does however mean that there's no homebrewed material here there's no kind of home rules on, on things that the book doesn't cover and if the book doesn't have an answer if there isn't a kind of answer a, a rules interpreter often will become unstuck. They won't really know how to approach things. So then they'll start scouring for, for some wiki rule or some online alternative interpretation. There'll be a lot of that going on as well. Dice rule. So whatever the dice says, that's what happens. Now, this often can become a bit of a trap for the rules interpreter when they are running things that have lots of tables that can be rolled upon. So especially if you look at some of the older versions of Dungeons & Dragons, there were encounter tables. So as the party was moving through territory, you'd roll to see just what kind of creatures they'd encounter, and you'd roll once every hour that they move uh, through the day. I remember at some points it was quite ridiculous. You were rolling 12d10 to see if there was an encounter. And of course, so the dice rules. So if you have lots of, di uh, lots of tables and things, you're going to be making lots of rolls, and a lot of the game is going to be directed by the outcome of the those dice. So that can be something that's quite laborious in one sense. But in another sense, again, there's that familiarity, there's that equality, everyone gets treated exactly the same way, there's no special treatment. Um, the GM is not seen as someone who favours the players or who favours the NPCs. They are literally just running this as the rules prescribe. Now, PC builds, when you're talking about a rules interpreter, people have to build their characters according to the rules. Obviously, I think that's standard across all of the different types of GMs, but what I mean by that is that they have to build a character that's in alignment with what the book is prescribing. So we're talking about building characters that are, to a large degree, maximized for their potential. So this is where you're getting really technical in your character builds, those kinds of things, because the rules as written will prescribe a certain outcome that the GM is going to be applying to your situations. So your characters need to be optimized to fit in with what the rules predict your characters to be like at specific levels or at, at points in that uh, character's progression. Grid combat often features as well with rules interpreters simply because it allows them to apply their rules very cleanly, very, very clearly, and to have the fallback onto the rules to say, well, a cone effect is actually this much, and we know for a specific reason that you are within the blast because we can see your miniature or your, your token 
on the grid. Again, this is, can be a big strength. It allows you to really visualize that battle, really kind of get involved in it. However, it does turn combat into much more of a tactical space. If you're not someone who has a lot of tactical skill as a GM, your players will outsmart you. Or if you are not a, if you have players who are not tactical, they're going to fumble every time as you outmaneuver them. So you've got to sort of rein back a little bit. No rules book ever has kind of covered the idea of the GM dumbing down the tactics rarely. It's about uh, making sure that there's a balance there. So the rules interpreter is a very solid, very safe GM. However, they can sometimes lack the spontaneity of being able to move off of the beaten path as prescribed by the rules or of being able to allow role playing to triumph or tr to to sort of flourish or grow within or without the context of the rules there so the rules interpreter is a very solid type of gm to start with now the galactic force i call this the galactic force because that's as exciting as it gets the rest is about consequences physics simulations the PCs are irrelevant in this kind of GM's environment. Yes, they are the characters that are moving through the adventures, but if they get squashed like bugs on the windscreen of this galactic force, it won't care, it will continue. These are incredibly, as I say, they are simulationists. They love to run this as a simulation. So they're using the rules and they're saying, right, the rules dictate X, Y, and Z. These are the values, absolutely. The rules where they don't cover that, we're going to fall back onto real world physics. We're going to look at, right, you need to eat this amount of food every single day. You need to keep a calendar so that your characters know when they should eat. You haven't eaten, right, we're going to go to the page that talks about starvation or lack of food if there is such a thing in the, the rule system that you're running and generally there will be galactic force gms generally like to have quite a structure it allows them to then just run those consequences oh well your character wants to jump out of a plane and land onto another plane absolutely we just need to calculate the uh, relative speeds of the two aircraft so i can work out how much damage you take from smashing into the windscreen of a plane 30 feet below you etc etc and those gms will apply that damage without mercy without any kind of well we'll fudge it a little bit or it's a heroic action so we'll make it less they will run it exactly as they feel the physics would determine so they're running a simulation now with consequences consequences are fantastic they make the world feel like it's real if the characters don't have any kind of consequences if there is no rebuttal to their action if there is no uh, idea that anything that they do has an impact there is no buy-in from the players their characters can do anything so they become murder hobos or they they lose interest in the space they need some kind of consequence so you need that absolutely physics i tend to err uh, not tend to err uh, i definitely err on the side of ignoring physics and i've had many discussions with people on this channel in the chats below usually where they accuse me of completely ignoring reality and i counter by saying well you have a giant flying lizard so who's ignoring reality more and how do you gauge whose reality is being ignored more and all those kinds of wonderful things with physics, again, you as a player are enabled to determine, right, well, if I try and do this, I will probably die because I try to do it in real life, I would probably die. So the game is most likely going to kill me if I try and do X and Y. Because let's be honest, the rule systems generally, although they do favor higher level characters, usually in expansionist kind of things, especially it's Dungeons and Dragons, when you start looking at a little bit more robust systems where it's a little bit less favored towards these super epic beings or where you've got a limited stamina or hit dice pool or health pool or whatever it is physics can become a major re redundancy or a, a, re a retardant is the word i'm looking for in terms of your characters being heroic it's almost the exact opposite of something like feng shui which was a role-playing system where you could run across bullets if you uh, made enough for, of a role so Physics is very important. Simulation is very important. This is also a GM who's not going to intervene on behalf of the players or on behalf of the NPCs either. They will run these things as simulations. The NPCs have planned X, Y, and Z. You want to break into a castle. This is how the castle is laid out. I'm not going to make any allowances for any kind of PC failure to thoroughly research invading that castle, to thoroughly investigate all options. And the guards will respond with force. They're not going to dilly and dally, and they're not going to be Skyrim guards who hear a noise and then go, well, it must have been the wind. They will be a very, very potent force protecting that castle because in the actual environment, that's what one expects. 
So simulationists provide a really interesting, a really challenging environment for players to try and survive in, but at the same time, they offer no leeway. There's very little GM hand-holding, if you like. It's all just, well, that's what was planned, that's what's happened, your characters are dead. And that's where the PCs are irrelevant. The stories don't revolve necessarily around the PCs. Sure, at the time, the PCs are the center of that narrative. They're following along. But if the PCs die, the world continues to tick over and no one sheds a tear. This can become rather disheartening, disenchanting for players because they go, well, if my character doesn't really make a difference, why should I be here? On the other hand, PCs become this nobody and they are struggling against the system. They're struggling not only against the NPCs and the plot, they're also struggling to survive in this very simulation-like world. And for a lot of people, that's very, very appealing. So it's not a bad thing at all, as long as your players are like that. I know that when I play, I try and gauge my players and I adjust the uh, the narrative accordingly. I, I make sure that the PCs have a chance of surviving unless they multiply, multiply compound, screw up upon screw up upon screw up. These GMs, Galactic Force GMs, are incredibly prepped and incredibly planned. There's a reason for that. They have to be. They need to know everything there so that they can make sure that the simulation is as accurate as possible, that the physics and that the consequences make absolute sense. So a GM who is doing this, if you are this kind of GM, you've probably got a lot of prepping and planning that goes on into your games. You're working out the movements of guards in that castle or in that prison. You're working out just how long it would take a starship to get from point A to point B. Those kinds of things need to be pre-calculated. Otherwise, during the game, you're going to have to ad-lib stuff, and that is not necessarily, oh, excuse me, that's not necessarily something that you should be doing or want to be doing, as a matter of fact, because sometimes that then allows for human error, etc., etc. And this is about running a simulation, about pre-planning. There's no adversarial intent from the GM, however. The GM is not trying to kill the players. The GM is simply allowing the players to experience this world. So that's galactic force. And there's, like I said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of these. And hopefully we're going to have a mixture of those as, uh, as we progress in our GMing experience. Now you get the narrator. Now, the narrator is very much the uh, type of role playing that I go for. I'm going to stand up right now and raise my hand and say, aye, that is me. I am a narrator, without a doubt. So the narrator directs the plots. They have these grand plots with these massive sweeping ideas as to how this is going to unfold. And that's what they push. They have themes. So has themes will travel type of thing themes about whatever it might be war love triumphs everything the power of the human slash dwarf slash elvish spirit uh, themes are very strong in these kinds of games because the plots are there so the themes are there they expect the players to buy into this more cinematic style of uh, gameplay. The characters are definitely very central to the entire story. So the players need to recognize that and act with a certain amount of, of respect for that. So if it's a comedic style campaign, the characters should be playing that space. The players should be playing that space. If it's a serious campaign and we're talking Game of Thrones type of thing, the, again, the players should play to that. And it does require the players to be aware that that's the type of GM that they have. If you are this kind of GM, it often helps to say, hey, listen, I like to play very story-based types of games where the characters are the central focus. The details, however, are generally vague. The narrator is not about planning. The narrator is not about necessarily having worked out every line of dialogue. The narrator is about telling and exploring a story just as the players are exploring it. So there's a reciprocal respect and expectation that the players are going to be bringing something to the story. The narrator is bringing the plot uh, to the adventure. And together, there's this coming, um, there's this, this mind meld, if you like, of the players and the GM working together to tell a story. Details are vague because if they're specific, the, the narrator can get stuck behind these specifics and now suddenly their players run the risk of their characters dying because of certain things. So details are usually very sort of vague. Descriptions are grandiose, but again, also a little bit vague so the narrator can build into that space. If you're a player and you like specifics, these kinds of narrators can be a little bit frustrating because you ask 
them very, very focused things and they don't necessarily give that to you. On the other hand, if, you're a, if you have players who love story, narrators are far better than Galactic Force. Galactic Force, although they definitely have a plot and they have story, there's no doubt about it, all of these GM styles do that. But the Galactic Force is sitting there going, well, the story can happen provided that you live long enough to experience it. The rules interpreter is saying, well, the, look, the, rule, the, the plot is there. I've filled in all of the markers according to the book. Uh, so you can experience it, but you've got to follow it and you need to, your dice and rules to, to make you get to that point. The narrator doesn't care about those kinds of things. Often dice rolls are done more for the tension of rolling the dice than the actual outcome. Uh, the characters stand very little chance of death unless they make really big mistakes. Now, very similar to the narrator, but very different from the the narrator as well as the author. Now, the author is the GM who's a world builder. These are GMs who have spent weeks or months or even years compiling their world and working out this little town has got a mining industry and that mining industry uses this type of ship which sails every three days from here to there. Now, they sound like they're a simulator, but they're not a simulator. They don't care about the minutiae in terms of timetables. What they care about is the world and coming up with their own languages, coming up with their own peoples, their own races, their own homebrew rules because they're getting in the way of their world which needs to have floating mountains or women who can sit in the middle of bonfires and be unscathed. They need to have that. So they're going to change everything to fit that. So world builders create these incredibly rich worlds that are usually hyper, hyper detailed. World building GMs, however, can sometimes A, get stuck that they haven't finished building every last corner of their world so they don't actually ever get around to GMing, or that because they have built every single thing into their world, when the characters ask for something, they just get over... Uh, they get a deluge of information that spans years worth of history because the GM has created, the author has created it. So they are very story focused, absolutely. But the story is not about the PCs. Author GMs oftentimes, because they've built this giant world, because they've got the space that they would want to explore, we explore their stories. They would love to walk through the fields of Dan Malgoon, which they have meticulously created and put the right creatures in there for that evolutionary period, as well as worked out the settlements around it, etc., etc. So the PCs are not included in, generally, generally speaking, these are all general terms, and in my opinion, just, just so that you know, but generally speaking the pcs are there and the gm then explores their own world they want to play in their own world so they there the pcs are there and the pcs must go where the gm wants to go in terms of, of discovering their own stuff the players must fit the players need to buy into this gm's world and then they need to understand it and follow it gms of this kind will be very very cold or distant to engage with players who go oh yeah I, I don't mind the set yeah i don't care about the setting the author gm is going but it's all about the setting it's all about my world it's all about discovering the secret of the 13 brotherhoods that have been ruling secretly from behind the throne of king elmar the 15th uh, for the last 400 years you need to know this stuff because otherwise etc etc so authors generally are creating spaces that they want to play and not necessarily that others are going to have a fun time playing in the outcomes are scripted the, the author is someone who goes this is the story i'm telling this is what i want to see happen this is how it's going to happen out and the players characters are going to fit into that otherwise my story is not going to come out my world expression is not going to come out that's the negative side the positive side of course is that you have these incredibly detailed worlds which if your players are into it they can go and explore any part of that world and they they know that there is a plan there's a narrative behind that there's a story behind that there's history that they can go and really get stuck into this is a type of fully immersive space they can start to learn the languages which often these gems have come up with uh, so that they can kind of really take part uh, and and feel as if they're in the space so definitely that's one of the major benefits so those are the first four types of GM that we're going to be looking at. As you can see, this video is already running to 20 minutes. So I've broken it into two pieces. There is, again, I repeat, no right or wrong style. 
There is a mixture of styles, and I'm sure that you'll go, well, I'm a little bit of a galactic force, and I'm a little bit of a narrator, and maybe a bit of an author, maybe, maybe not. Anyway, the idea here is just to expose you to these different types and to look at the strengths that each one brings. I know certainly I myself, I've often had a very... Uh, casual approach to the rule systems of the various systems that I do run. And the reason why is that I don't want to get bogged down with all these kinds of rules that are going to get in the way of me telling my story. Um, or at least of me helping the players to tell a story. I'm a little bit of an author meets narrator, uh, definitely. There's a lot of... Uh, yeah, that, that's me, that's me. I think the only thing that I'm really not is the galactic force. I'm not an impartial GM. I'm definitely on the side of the players, on the side of the characters. I want them to succeed. I want them to be heroes. So that's me. And if you are someone who is a simulationist, you might struggle in my games uh, to find a consistency and a logic that, that really kind of makes sense. On the other hand, I have people who want to play in my games because they're so story-focused. Now, if you're a simulationist and you're sitting there going, well, how do I become more like this? How do I add more story to my game? I don't know. Well, that's what this whole channel is about, is adding story, really, adding plot and story to your game system. And I have tried to do it in a way that's fairly methodical, that's fairly almost rules-based, so that it can apply to people who are not innate, innately storytellers or, or narrators of the sort. Next week, we're going to cover the other bunch of um, GMs that are out there. That's the uh, villain type of GM, the player type of GM, the not a GM, the actor, and the modular uh, GM. So those GMs are on that side of the list, generally because they are, in my opinion, GMs who, with some help, can become great GMs and they'll fit into these top four. These top four, as far as I'm concerned, are really where the, the bulk of GMs are sitting. The lower five, as you'll see next week, is where you've got GMs who've got problems and that their stories, their games, generally won't run for very long or they're going to have lots of player turnaround moving in and out of those groups. Why? Well, you'll find out next week. Until next time, hit that like button if you agree with these GM styles. If I lift any out, if you can't sort of see them on the list preemptively write down in the uh, comments below so that we can have a look and we can discuss that and something that I think is very affirming for you to do is to write down saying well I'm actually a bit of a rules interpreter and a galactic force and a bit of a narrator I'm not an author at all I don't do world building I don't do this I don't do that um, it's something that you can look at and by verbalizing it by articulating it sometimes you can say well I'm actually just a galactic force is that necessarily a bad thing? No, not if your players are having fun. But if you are finding that your players cycle out, or if you do have a high turnover of games collapsing and starting afresh, perhaps it's time to look at your GMing style and say, well, maybe if I was a galactic force with a bit more author, I might have more player buy-in, or I might have a better opportunity. I know certainly I'm going to try and become more of a rules interpreter as well as an narrator. Now that's not, I'm not going to stick to raw. That's absolutely beyond my comprehension. I don't like to do that kind of thing, except that there's one raw rule generally, and it's in most of the books. So definitely in the DMG, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons book, um, the GM's rule is law. So whatever the gym comes with. So I'm going to use that raw to allow me to overwrite all the other uh, raw ru you know, rules that have been written. Anyway, that's my excuse and I'm going to stick to it until next time. I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming.